next consultant and board of directors. Board of directors, I would like to welcome you to the 2024 Best Practice Showcase to celebrate technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Jonathan Soto, and I will be presenting the speakers for the concluding session of this meeting. Before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please, please check your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruptions. This, this session is being recorded. This presentation will be in English, and finally, our staff will pass the QR code to our participant to complete the electronic evaluation for this session before leaving the room. You can also find the QR code on your name badge. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to us. Now we're ready to start. The current session track is Access, and the title of the presentation is Building Access Pathways for Non-Credit Excel Students and their, favorite, and their Families at a Community College. Please welcome John Hahn and Paola da Silva from La Guardia Community College. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about three different access pathways for non-credit students uh, at LaGuardia Community College. And just a little bit about who we are. So my name is John Hunt. I'm the Assistant Dean for Pre-College Academic Programs at LaGuardia in our Division of Adult and Continuing Education. So my background is as an ESL teacher, and uh, I've been at LaGuardia for almost 20 years now, and I used to work at the Center for Immigrant Education and Training, where Hal and I were both hired by the same director, in, in, inaugural director at CIT. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Paula Michelin, and I'm the director for the Center for Immigrant Education and Training. Um, I have been a Laguardian for 21 years. I got there one year before John. Um, and we mainly uh, serve low income, low income immigrants in Queens. So, a little bit about Laguardia. So, uh, Laguardia is part of the CUNY system, it's one of the community colleges, the two year colleges at CUNY. Um, so, we are a large urban campus in Queens, New York. Uh, we have currently 13,000 credit students and then 9,300 non-credit students. So we are a very robust um, continuing education division, uh, which has been great because we really have a lot of support from our academic side, our student affairs side, um, support for our community college, for our uh, non-credit students. Um, and a little bit about Queens. So 57% of the 1.8 million Queens residents are actually foreign born. Um, so it's a huge percentage. Uh, so many of our students are immigrants or the children of immigrants. Um, so there's a lot of support for our ESL programs in the college. And uh, about 518,000 are limited English proficient of that group. Um, so as you can say, it's, it's a huge population of English language learners that we have in Queens in need of services. And there's always a great need uh, and a lot of advocacy done to have more free ESL seats uh, in the community. Um, so 200,000, 209,000 are underutilized skilled immigrants um, in New York City. So this is a study that came out of the Migration Policy Institute to show. So these are skilled professionals. And we're going to be talking a little bit about how we have served those skilled professionals who have immigrated to the US. Um, so they're, they're not coming on H-1B visas. They have come on lottery visas, for example. Um, but they're not able to access their prior professions without some assistance, and we've been trying to do that. Um, so our Division of Adult and Continuing Education, where we work, uh, we do a lot of ESL and GED, high school equivalency programs. We do them in English and in Spanish. Um, we have the CUNY Language Immersion Program. We're going to talk a little bit about our CUNY STAR. So these are pre-matriculation programs um, in support of our non-credit students. And then workforce training and business services students. So with all this in mind and with this background, um, LaGuardia created with some human, they started the Center for Immigrant Education and Training. We were housed at the Adult Continuing Education Division. And we offer free English classes to low-income immigrants. So our students are mostly Queens residents. Um, and we offer different programs. They're all grant-funded. They're all free. There are no cost to the students. We have a family literacy program that we want to talk a little bit more about it. We serve immigrant parents, educating them about the rights and responsibilities about the American education system. 
We also have citizenship classes, civics classes, and um, career, career um, focused classes. That's the CUNY Adult Real Estate Program. Um, we also have the easel workforce development programs. So with the New York City Welcome Back Center is part of CIT, and we work with healthcare professionals, helping them to get relicensed in New York State. We also have a community health worker program and a medical medical assistant. So what makes them very unique, the workforce training programs that we have, we use something that was called the IBAS model, and now they have a new um, name that's called the Integrated Education and Technology Tra Training. Thank you, John. Um, and what we do is we have the ESOL instructors and the professionals in the field working together, developing a curriculum um, and helping to bridge the language gap. So the goal is really to bring these individuals back to the workforce training. Um, yes. And just to note about, um, so I was starting last week, well, right before okay. the holidays, and this week um, something we're calling English Express, which has been, we got a small amount of funding to do uh, services for asylum seekers. So as many cities have seen, uh, we have a huge influx of asylum seekers, of kind of new, uh, new arrivals coming into the city. We've been tr struggling. We already don't have enough seats in ESL programs. Um, so this is a small project we've started to bring those asylum seekers onto campus to kind of do some initial intake and assessment to see if they have uh, high school degrees from their countries, what their level of English might be, um, what they might be interested in, and giving them some very basic um, English workshops that we've been doing weekly. And then we're going to see if in subsequent semesters we can get them into our regular ESL classes or with our partners. We have a lot of community-based organizations in the area that also have free classes. So this is kind of a pilot we're starting now called English Express through the Petrie Foundation. So today we're going to be talking about three different kinds of access pathways. So one is access to credentialing for non-credit students, specifically for English language learners. Um, access to higher education, so access to credit classes, um, transitioning folks, transitioning our non-credit, our non-credit, non-traditional students, adult students, into uh, some credit pathways, and then access to parent engagement um, for immigrant students. So the first one is our EEIT to credentialing. So EIET is Integrated Education and Technology. So this is really a federal initiative um, around the country based on partly on the IBEST model that started in Washington State, which as Paola said is really a team teaching model. So trying to integrate ESL or sometimes basic skills into workforce training. So it really means having two teachers participating in the same course, usually at the same time as much as possible. Um, so the ESL teacher is obviously developing students' linguistics ability and then the workforce trainer and in our case in, in, in our case we're youth and we're partnering with our nursing faculty on campus for our NCLEX program or we partnered with the trainers for our community health based workers for example. So why did this program come about? Why did IBES happen? Why did IETs happen? Because of the traditional credentialing pathway, especially for English language learners. So what in the past we might have asked them to do is do all your ESL coursework, get to the highest level, and maybe after the highest level, after the free classes are finished, the federal classes top out at what's called NRS 7, which is really only intermediate, and many times they can't bridge that gap to go into a training or into college. Uh, fulfill the skills requirement, and then maybe you can enter into a training program if they'll let you in, and the tape test is all right. Um, so the challenges here is obviously you have people who are doing ESL forever. They've been years in ESL and they're not able to leave the ESL programs to do their next steps. Um, they get dis uh, discouraged, so they might drop out, they might not persist or transition. And then there's a gap between when you finish ESL, when supposedly you finish and you exit our ESL programs, but they might not let you into the next training program or they might not let you into English 101. So they kind of get stuck there. Um, use of the tape test for reading comprehension is often a barrier and then training program pedagogy and curricula, it might be a little, in some of our training programs, we found it was a little too chalk and talk. 
Um, the trainers might not be used to having English language learners in the classroom, so they might be kind of going through the material as quickly as possible. We try to kind of blend in um, some ESL uh, pedagogy into that. So, like I said, we work with non-traditional students, so those are some of the barriers that we, that we have. So we recruit um, foreign trainers as an example of the in-class program. So they come in with a low language proficiency, um, and then we need to help them to understand, to improve their language skills so they can eventually pass the in-class exam and join the workforce training program. They are not familiar with the workforce at the U.S., um, they also, they, a lot of times our students, they've been here for a few years already, they have left the profession. So we have to retrain them, build up their self-esteem, and have them join again the workforce training. Um, they also don't understand how to navigate the system. Uh, they have to go to different agencies to, become, to, be, to get their uh, authorization to test. So we help them with that process as well. Um, also, the idea of employers hiring someone who has a foreign degree. So how that translated to this of the American um, workforce system. Um, there's a lot of, our classes are 16 hours long. So again, our students have their parents, they're older, they have family obligations. So for them to balance uh, working, coming to school, and learning again how to be a student. So that's a challenge. Uh, and also there's a lot of financial issues with our students. We work with students who are domestic violence victims, we work with students who live in shelters, we work with students who have many uh, two jobs and be able to come to school and then get the credentials again. So since so this is the official IET uh, kind of model that the federal government is promoting uh, for good reason because it is an effective model and it really has three parts for them is adult education and literacy that's mainly ESL and our part um, the workforce training which is really the content that is needed to pass your credentialing exam and to get your license and then workforce preparation which is generally kind of uh, how the US system works maybe resume um, writing uh, workforce readiness uh, in a general sense of the interviewing perhaps um, and how we kind of interpret it, we called it an I-BEST after the I-BEST model. And really it's a lot of recruitment that we do to kind of find folks who are at our Cinderella level. So we're not trying to serve anyone who's too high because they don't need our help. Their English is solid enough. We can't take folks who are too low because they're not ready for the programs yet. So we are really looking at someone who's around the seventh and eighth grade reading level on the tape um, for these programs. And then they do what's kind of a vestibule, so we sort of get them back into the classroom. As Paula said, um, most of them have been outside of the classroom for a little while. Our average for the nurses, for example, is they've been in the U.S. for five years outside of their profession. So they have not been nurses for five years, some of them longer. Um, so some of them graduated from their nursing schools even more before that. So they haven't been in the classroom. The vestibule is kind of their time to see, is this program right for me? Um, I can get them back into the classroom. And then it's the intensive training program, which is team taught for it. So there's kind of more ESL at the beginning, and then it, it, yeah, and, and the content might get harder or, or more intense, the workforce content later on. And then obviously the goal for this credentialing is really employment. So that's where we're, we're trying to take them. Um, and it has a few different components to it. So intensive student intake and onboarding, as I said, um, really about the embedded advisement. We have full-time case managers for these programs because they are dealing, as Paula said, with so many issues. So, you know, we might think, especially for the nursing program, they're professionals, you know, they made it through the systems in their countries, but they're really dealing with a lot of, uh, of issues of, as many of our immigrant families are, so that embedded advisement really is needed uh, to retain them into a program. As Paula said, it's 16 hours a week, it's an eight-month program, our NCLEX program. So we really, um, and our funders really want a 95% retention rate in this program, and they start the clock on day one, and if they're not there on the last day, we lose money. It's a performance-based contract usually for these programs. So we, uh, we are very motivated to keep all the students in there. It's usually about 20 per cohort, and we're usually running two cohorts at a time. So 
CIT, uh, the Welcome Back Center is part of CIT, but the Welcome Back Center is a national initiative that works with uh, foreign trained health professionals. So it's in Washington State, California, Illinois, so Rhode Island. Nationally. Yes. And uh, we help to create career pathways to help individuals to get relicensed. And our focus is immigrant nurses. And what we do, we contextualize um, nursing content to the ESOL classes. And that's why we're so successful in what we do. Because the students are learning the language at the same time they're learning the technical content. So how do we measure our success? Um, our recruitment outreach program is key for our success. We usually see around three to 400 individuals that come in through our pipeline. And through the outreach and intake process, we end up selecting anywhere between 40 candidates to 45 candidates. And that takes about five months, maybe. Um, we want them to be, or we want help these students to uh, set up realistic goals. Can you actually do this? I mean, sometimes they want to do, but that's not the perfect time for them. But like I said before, we help them to navigate and get their credentials again set up um, their goals, um, not on professional, but also educational. We help them to build their resumes, cover letters, help them to uh, interview prep. We have a few employers, partners, that we set up with the students. They come in to talk to the students. We have a panel, employee panel, um, and help them to get a job. One of our outcomes is job, uh, is job outcomes, so we have to help our students to be placed in. And we do. <laughs> so these are some of our impact outcomes here. So the average student um, was reading at an eighth grade level. When they came in, they're all English language learners. Um, so their first language is not English. Um, they've been about 4.5 years in the US. Um, some unemployed at intake. 46% um, of them working outside of the healthcare sector. Um, usually about five years experience as nurses in their home countries. Our retention rate is over 90%, so we did get that performance-based <laughs> uh, reimbursement. Um, and then our pass rate has been over 70%, uh, when the national average is 43% for this population who have not gone through a program like ours. And unfortunately, for those who have to take it multiple times, it's only 27%. These are uh, foreign-trained nurses coming. So we, you know, we've pretty much doubled uh, or tripled that rate, um, which we're very proud of. And you know these nurses are in need, um, especially in New York City. Uh, uh, we work closely with the city's um, Department of Employment or Small Business Services because uh, they are really looking for bicultural and bilingual nurses to work in the healthcare field in New York City because we have so many uh, bilingual and bicultural uh, or folks who need those services, patients who need those services. Um, and the most important thing is these nurses are getting jobs immediately in New York City, thankfully, and they are getting jobs at like seventy-five to $90,000 a, uh, a year uh, right after finishing the program. So this, these are folks who might have been home health aides when they started with us, they might have been unemployed, they might have been cashiers outside of the healthcare workforce. So this is really like the most life-changing program that I've been involved with, which is amazing. Um, so the IET model, you know, it, it works. So it's really an opportunity to give access to people at lower levels who might not be able to go through a program like this. It is fast track, they're not stuck in ESL forever. We're combining the ESL at the same time. They're preparing for their credentials, um, developing their language proficiency. Students are super engaged and super motivated because they see, they see dollar signs at the end of the program, they see a license, they see getting back to their uh, profession, um, and they really do retain information um, and the credentialing pass rates show that they are successful. Um, so that was our first access pathway. We're on to number two now, uh, keeping you on time. So um, the next one we're going to talk about is a little bit of our higher education transitioning for our non-traditional students. So what are the barriers? So in continuing education, we are always talking about 
or our, our colleagues in student affairs and our colleagues in academic affairs are always say, why don't you send us more students from, from non-credit? Um, and we want to send students, but many of our students are ESL learners or they're just finishing their GEDs. Um, so we have to deal with some of the barriers. One of the barriers is lack of awareness of college pathways. So some of our ESL students don't know that they can go to college. You know, they might not have thought about it. They don't even associate their ESL program with coming in to the college. So we really want to make sure they understand. We're very lucky that we our classes, our non-credit ESL classes happen on campus. So immediately we try to make them feel like you are a CUNY student here on campus. You're not some random student. This is an education for our, our, our colleagues as well on campus to make sure that they are treated like real students um, as well. Uh, and a lack of uh, awareness about community colleges. Community colleges don't exist in some of the countries that our students come from, so they're not really aware that that's an option that you can just do a two year or that you can qualify in CUNY. The community colleges are open to anyone who has a high school diploma from their countries from here or who gets a GED. They are automatic, they are, they are qualified to come, we just have to figure out how to pay for them. Um, so financial aid is obviously a concern. Um, we have scholarships available. We can help them with the FAFSA application. Um, the CUNY application is sometimes difficult to navigate. I'm sure many of our universities' applications are that way. So we really want to help our ESL students and our GED students as well to navigate that. So we kind of walk them through what documents will be asked for. How do you answer these questions? Um, are you a transfer student? Are you a freshman student if you did some college? in your country or not. Um, another thing we've done is our GED in Spanish and our regular GED programs is trying to make sure those students don't feel that the GED has to be their end point. Um, so they're taking GED, GED classes as well on campus, but making sure that you know that's their immediate goal, they want that diploma, but also what's going to happen next. So we try to grab them as soon as they might pass one of the GED subtests or when they're kind of ready to test, we want to grab them and say, hey, we'll help you do the CUNY application. Even if you're not going to go right now, let's get that out of the way. So you're ready to go. When you're ready to go to college, you're already accepted. Um, and a lack of, of, of awards of credentialing options uh, for in-demand careers is something else we want to talk to them about going to college or going to our credentialing program. Um, so one thing that we did um, to assist this project was to create a career development center on campus. So this is part, it's, it's in our division of adult and continuing ed. Uh, you might kind of call it um, a supplementary admissions office for our non-credit students. Our folks in admissions are wonderful people, but they are more used to dealing with high school students who are leaving K-12 through and coming right into community college, coming into CUNY. So sometimes our students are a little more complicated. They're adults, they're older, they might have foreign degrees, uh, foreign high school degrees, they might have just gotten their GED in Spanish. Um, so we kind of created, uh, we have advisors in the Career Development Center, the CDC, which is inappropriate. <laughs> After the pandemic, it became a little more difficult, but we have the, the it's called the CDC. And they do come there um, and really get walked through the whole process. So this is an example of a flyer that we give out in our classes um, to our ESL students and our GED students to say, hey, do you know, you can start your associate degree, your two-year degree, or if you're in an ESL program learning English, but you don't have your high school degree from your country, uh, you can also come to a GED class. So some of our students are doing GED classes and ESL classes. Some of them might do an ESL class and then go in to their GEDs uh, or vice versa there. Um, we'll help you to apply to the CUNY Language Immersion Program, I'll talk about it in a second. Um, the Accuplacer is the exam that our ESL students have to take, so we kind of talk them through what that might mean, um, their scores for the Accuplacer, financial aid and scholarships, um, or starting a certification. So this is kind of our one-stop shop where uh, advisors will really help them to go through that process and make sure that they can transition. Um, so on that survey for the QR code, this is an example of some of the options that were available to students. So do you want to do the CUNY application for two years? Do you want to go to a different CUNY that might be more appropriate or closer to your home? Um, I want to follow up on my application. Or I have questions about financial aid and scholarships. I want a GED. 
um, or I'd like to know about workforce training. So depending on those answers, we will send them to different workshops that might be happening, usually online through Zoom, and then they will get a call from our advisors to kind of, and then everyone is tracking them through the process to make sure that they get to the other side. And uh, if they have any issues with the admissions office, we can intervene directly with the admissions office, give them a call and say, hey, make sure you know this is one of our students. So it's not just a new student off the street. This is one of our ESL students that's been great, has great attendance, and we want them to come into the university. Uh, we, they just need to get through a few, uh, few parts of the application. Um, and then we do have a really great option at CUNY called the CUNY Language Immersion Program. So this is something we can recommend to our ESL students who are not at the highest levels, perhaps. The CUNY Language Immersion is an intensive academic ESL program that is pre-matriculation. So they, they have to apply to the university, be accepted to the university, but then they will take the AccuPlacer um, and kind of be in uh, what we might call remedial or developmental education range. So they are not eligible for English 101, they're eligible now for CLIP. This program, they don't use financial aid, uh, it's supplemented from the city, they only have to pay $75, and these are 25 hour a week courses that go quarterly, and a student can go through this program for a year. So they can have a lot of intense, intensive English for a very low price, and the goal of this program is really to get them ready to jump into English 101 when they start using their financial aid. So not to be using their financial aid for remedial English programs if that's possible. And there we also have wraparound services for them with an advisor to walk them through what's going to happen next. They can take the AccuPlacer again at the end of this program and then hopefully their scores have jumped in there and then they're getting used to being on the campus as well. So this we might recommend to our lower level ESL students, do something in our free program when you're ready, do the application to CUNY, go through the CLIP program, and then they'll be ready to transition um, in, a, in a much better state. Um, and also just an example, some of our, we have a large tuition based program as well. Um, and this, we gave that survey to those students, and these are some of the, kind of the backgrounds. So one of the challenges we had is in our tuition based ESL program, we're not asking that many questions of those students when they come to enroll with us. We're just saying, what class do you want? Do you have a credit card that works? And they're coming and going, this is not Paolo's program, the free program, this is a different department that just does not credit ESL. But we really wanted to know those students, do they want to come to CUNY as well? Or did they already have degrees? Or did they need GED? We didn't have much data on them, so we started asking them to fill out the survey while they were in the tuition classes so that we could see. And this is just a sample representation we did of one round of those students. We found out some of them only had high school, so they would be freshmen, or they didn't have high school yet. So they might be referred to our GED programs. And then others of them had some degrees from their home country, so they might be transfers wanting to come into CUNY, or they might be professionals that we didn't know about. So maybe there are nurses in that program, so once we talk to them, we can find out, did you know about Paola's NCLEX program for ESL learners, so we can recruit them from there. Yes, and we also have a credit for prior learning uh, program that's open through Robin Hood Foundation um, in the last year or two years ago. Um, so we're also doing, uh, trying to leverage that in this process. So if they are applying to CUNY, we're also trying to see, did they have actual credit for prior learning? And we're also taking a look at the CLEP exam um, from the college board to see, for example, if some of our Spanish-speaking students might be able to take the CLEP exam, pass that exam while they're taking their GED in Spanish, and then come in with some credits. That LaGuardia will honor those credits from the CLEP exam. So they might be able to start their academic careers already with credits backed. So another way of helping our students to um, to oh, sorry to transition is uh, we have a parent engagement support. So we have our family literacy program that we talked talk a little bit about before. So our family literacy uh, program is grant funded by New York State. And the goal of the program is to help uh, independent parents to learn about um, the education systems in the United States. 
and we teach them, uh, you know, English as a second language at the same time that we educate them about their rights and responsibilities as an immigrant parent. We talk about this, the tests that the kids have to take. We talk about uh, what are some of the free services that they can receive in the community. Uh, the goal of CIT is we, we offer wraparound services. So it's not only about what they learn in class, it's also about teaching them about the community so they can become more informed and better parents, right? Uh, one of the things that we do, uh, we partner with different uh, art organizations in the community. We have a family night that we bring parents and kids together to celebrate so they learn about the college community with the goal of the parents becoming familiar with what it's to be in a home campus. Um, during the pandemic, um, we, oh, so let me talk a little bit about the barriers that we have with our parents. That they have low literacy level, um, their English is very, sometimes it's very low. Um, they don't understand the American system, the education system. Also, they don't have, um, financially they might work two jobs or they work in an informal job, which is hard to um, regulate how much money they can make. They have low self-esteem and they are unable to take an active role in their children's education. So the reason that I'm pointing this out is that during the pandemic, um, we came to the realization when everybody went remote that our parents or students could not assist their kids with their homework assignments. And the main reason that they couldn't assist them, their kids with the homework assignment, they couldn't understand the language from the homework assignment. So we created this thing called Online Learning Hub. And the Online Learning Hub offers, thank you, <laughs> offers free ESF, EL, uh, ELA, math, and science tutoring sessions for the kids and the parents at the same time. So they connect online via Zoom, and we, we partner, we pair a tutor with a family, and they can take as many classes as they want during the week, and it's completely free. So that eliminates a lot of the barriers. So it's a free tutoring program. They don't, they, they are engaged with their kids in the learning process, so the kids then start seeing the parent as someone that they can help them also with their homeworks, not only the tutor. Um, and uh, I think that's another one of this. So how do we get our volunteers? So we don't have any grant funded for this. We use different agencies in the city. We have uh, different partners. We went to the community, to the college, and we put students from the college to help us serve the students and their families. So this is our learning love hub approach. approach. Um, they are only students from the family literacy program. It's a one-on-one -on -one sessions in math, science, and ELA. They meet via Zoom or uh, Google Teams. They meet every week. Um, and the goal is really to bridge the educational gap and to give these kids the opportunity of do well in school as well. We have different partnerships with different nonprofit organizations in New York City. One of them is the Advocate for Children, which help our parents to understand how the Board of Ed works in New York. Um, and also to help the students develop independent study skills. That's it for us. So please feel free to ask any of our preparation questions. We know non-credit can be a little bit complicated. <laughs> we can be a different beast, um, uh, and it is a little complicated at the board as well. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. To ask.
before you uh, wait for your question. Any questions? When he, uh, when he said that he broke community college, um, are you folks the only community school that does the IET? Please don't tell my PP that I'm not sure who we are working for. <laughs> uh, there, there's a few, um, you probably heard it called IELCE. Okay. So there's uh, the federal government has an IELCE part of the IET. Um, so who else is doing IELCE? Kingsborough. Uh, uh, BMCC. BMCC was doing technology. Kingsborough. <laughs> So Kingsborough does culinary, but you folks are the ones that are doing nursing. I ask this a lot. I'm, I'm in admissions so often. We get students that come and they're like, oh, you know, I want to start working. What can I do my credentials? And to know that we can refer them out to somewhere else that they can really yeah, sure. refer them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then just like I guess more information about the family literacy program. Is that also something that you only offer to other? It's a good question. There used Albany used to have a grant that was specific for ESL family literacy. Um, it kind of sunset or kind of put, went into different areas. So we're actually doing it through the Adult Literacy Education Grant, which is an Albany specific um, RFP that comes out where we are doing kind of family literacy. So we're subject to the same. It's an ESL RFP, so we're subject to the same kind of retention. They have to make gains on the best plus exams or a speaking exam. It's just we contextualize all of the content to uh, parent engagement for it. And it's been running, I think, and I. 20? So 20 years, years yeah. It was, it was started by the so founding director. How many families do you have like, participating in tutoring program? Right now? So right now we have 144 students actually enrolled. That's awesome. Um, and then for the online learning hub, we are serving 44 families, 66 kids. And the reason that we're not serving more is because we don't have enough tours. Wow. Actually, the Powell's Hold Center is running 22 cohorts at the moment, intensive cohorts. So in all of the programs that we saw in that grid, and most of the classes are nine hours a week to 16 hours a week. So these are intensive programs running every quarter. Um, so Powell hires a lot of teachers. Every yeah. semester, so it's a it's a huge department. And it was very much my was kind of moves as we're trying things we're trying to reach out to our adult learners, and we're looking at continuing education, but then we're also thinking about how can we engage our parents, um, the high school students' parents. But it's like kind of working backwards. Like these are the students in the Spanish GED. It's kind of worked out. You know, let's start making working with the students so that once the students are ready to graduate from high school, it's kind of like. GD person's graduating, you can enroll them into the community college, but you can also start to work with their kids. It's like, oh. Um, yeah. The family literacy is um, we do try to engage the kids and bring them to campus. So, and also to teach the parents about going to college. So, we offer going to college workshops for our students. Um, they have a little bit, they have different barriers. Um, the same ones that John said, but a lot of them are undocumented. So their pathway is a little bit different. Um, but the idea is to bring the whole family so they get used to being on campus. Yeah. And then I think about CUNY Explorers and how that could come into it because it's you know, college for all yeah. of the 12 initiative and it's just like all these pieces kind of bringing together. So first of all, I want to say congratulations. This is a really life-changing program that you're offering and it's a compounded impact because it's not just the candidates and the students, it's also the patients that they're serving and the familial impact. So congratulations on that. And John, you alluded to that, that you said this is like one of the most impactful programs that you talk about in nursing. So my question is, are you familiar or do you know or what are the opportunities for developing something similar for pharmacy students? Which is where we come through because, I mean, just, we have what, 30, about anywhere between at a given time, 35 to 50 students from Puerto Rico in our pharmacy program. And they also are seeing a licensure at the end of that you know, six-year track. They're seeing a, a job at the end of that six-year track. And their English is pro proficient enough for conversation, but when it comes to the technical and the, the, the aspects of pharmacy curriculum, which is the same thing that you talked about your nursing curriculum being aligned, that would be a fascinating you know, avenue for access. And because it would also, there's need for those pharmacists in, as primary caregivers in the society as well. So 
So thank you for your balance. It's a good question. So there are, um, I think, 11 welcome back centers across the country. Some of them concentrate more on nurses. Some of them concentrate more on foreign trained doctors, physicians, trying to get them a match. I'm not sure if anyone's doing pharmacists, yes. but we can take a look. Um, and as I said, the federal government is really trying to promote these IET models mm -hmm. for exactly that reason. Like you could have pharmacy with ESL, pharmacy with basic skills. So um, they have uh, some L-I-N-C-S, links is part of the federal government's um, depository there. And they have a lot of curriculum stuff. So they might have something on pharmacy and then you might be able to see if some university has done pharmacy IET because I wouldn't be surprised if someone's doing it. They're really trying to promote this because the model works with any credential. It's just a matter of how long the program would have to be, how intensive it would have to be, how difficult the credential is, and kind of how low the proficiency level is of the students you're trying to take in. But it would definitely work. Okay, thank you. I just want to say one more thing. One thing that we've been looking at is to create something that's called the bridge programs because the students don't have the reading level they need to be to join an IET program, they can join a bridge program, focus on reading and right. vocabulary, group, contextualize, and then move on mm -hmm. to the IET training program. Mm -hmm. Thank as, you. Say, as, as Paula was saying, when she takes in 400 students for the nursing program, the vast majority of those we can't take because they are reading at the fourth grade reading level or the fifth grade reading level, and they're just still too low. So the need for those bridge programs. And these are immigrant nurses who are professionals in their country. So theoretically, learning English would be faster for them because they have positive educational experiences at home. But often, that's not the case. They need a lot more support. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Once you make the decision to come to New York, 
or being in the United States, that we want to be able to offer these individuals the best opportunities so they can be successful here as well. So when I started working here, we had family literacy program as one of the classes that we offer. But nowadays, we offer citizenship. We also have civics. We also have a, a very large portfolio of uh, workforce training programs, mostly in the healthcare. So I am the Vegas, Los retos cuando llegamos a este país son muchos. El idioma es el principal porque pensamos que las personas nos van a entender y entonces eso da mucho temor. Por ejemplo, en mi caso de enfermería, eh, incluso yo fui a una agencia donde ayudan a conseguir trabajo a los inmigrantes y decían en tu caso nosotros no podemos porque tú tienes que validar tu degree, tú tienes que poner un examen aquí, entonces es frustrante. Y al principio fue un poco difícil buscando información y no encontrando dónde tenía que ir. Me decían que yo tenía que comenzar la, la escuela nuevamente. Entonces un día una persona que ayuda a las enfermeras con el proceso para registrarse y validar el, el grado aquí en este país, me dijo que la guardia tenía clases de repaso para enfermeras extranjeras. Entonces yo dije, oh, está perfecto. My name is Ava Nandez and I work as an education case manager. We help in everything from beginning to end. We are recruiting students for the program and the goal of the program of the NCLEX RN for English language learners is to identify applicants that have their nursing degree and license from their country of origin who are residents in New York City and have permission to work to assist them in passing the licensing exam, which allow them to work as registered nurses in New York City. My grandparents are from Puerto Rico, and I, I've seen because of the, the lack of, of services, also the lack of connecting to those services and navigating through the city, that there were many opportunities that they didn't have for themselves, as well as my parents. So, um, you know, what CUNY does well is looks at the needs and the, the population in terms of um, the industry and, and, and the job market and it, it seeks to meet those needs and develop programs to meet those needs and that's why right now we see those uh, shortage in healthcare professions. And the motivation is knowing that there's people that, you know, with a lot of effort they have, many have left their family behind. You're just left to wanting to help someone for improvement to improve their, their life for themselves as well as their family. Also, they want to contribute to the city to improve life here for everyone else. Cuando yo conseguí este programa en, en la Guardia Community College, vi, un, como dicen, una gran puerta abierta. Porque da la oportunidad para yo prepararme y, y también este, tener los conocimientos de lo que debía hacer. Y, y romper el miedo también. <risa> porque tenía mucho temor con lo del idioma, porque me habían dicho tanto que no se podía que yo no creía que iba a poder entrar a trabajar en el área. Finalmente ya yo tengo un año trabajando como enfermera. Yo pasé el examen en agosto del año pasado. Y como latina, pues siempre trato de motivar a los demás. Entonces, nosotros como latinos tenemos aquí un mundo es muy diferente a, a nuestros países cuando venimos aquí y hay miles de oportunidades. Eh, no, no sabemos, muchas veces hemos buscado y quizá buscamos en el sitio equivocado, pero que nunca nos detengamos, que siempre sigamos indagando, preguntando, porque a la larga nosotros vamos a conseguir lo que tanto soñamos. Bueno. Thank <laughs> you.